My name is Tomas, I'm from Ljubljana, Norway. Um, I've been studying and working in London and Berlin, Norway. And at the end, I was working at the Technical University in Berlin, working on two research projects and teaching. My teaching is mainly about uh, like urban scale um, development, urban design, with thinking about urban systems. And today I'm going to talk to you about something much different from, let's say, a classical way of doing uh, architectural urban design. How do you start this? I'm, I'm new to, to Max. So, um, So I'm going to talk about uh, production in the city. Why? Because I think it's really important to think about um, what in the last, let's say, 30 years, what we have lost within the cities of the West. And I'll talk a lot about what kind of culture, basically, um, in that industry or making or craft is actually producing and how we are changing our cities through not having this kind of culture as part of the cities. So it's going to be a, a slightly different view at, let's say, what cities are. And it's a more philosophical view at, let's say, economical and also urban level problems in order to understand what the cities are. And I would like to start with this. Um, I think that cities are the mirror of our aspirations. What does that mean? That means that for us, when we look at the cities or when we um, look or try to understand them, we see where we as, as, as human beings or we as a culture aspire for. And uh, what I want to do is kind of reevaluate re what making is and how making and industrial production can again become part of the city. And for that, I will try to start somewhere like this. Um, what you see here is a, is a first uh, Highland uh, Ford factory in in Detroit, and this is the first place where they implemented the where they implemented the, the um, conveyor belt and the mass production. And I will try to talk about industry as culture and not industry as utility. What you what you usually think about, like when you think about products that we create, the products that we use, is that how the industry produces these products. But what I would like to talk about is how the industry that produces these products produces all the culture and the life that is around it. So, um, first assembly line that was created was created on the basis of these magnetos. So this is the first product that they actually tried to turn the process around. Right? Before you had people who were looking at, who had a lot of different chores and they did a lot of different things. Um, let's say, assembling one Magneto would be one person doing a lot of different things at the same time. And you had knowledge to use different types of tools and so on. And now this, this process started to be reversed. So they looked, they took the whole process of assembly of Magneto apart and they said, okay, this part one person can do. And you created this kind of uh, assembly line where each person does only one thing at one time. And what this happened when, when they did this, what happened was that the uh, assembly time was reduced from 15 to 5 minutes and the amount of people that you needed for this uh, turned from 29 to 14. So you had a really big increase in production. Um, these kind of things were really important in that time. Uh, Taylorism, or let's say scientific management, is, a, is an approach to understanding things as systems. To understanding what is the most uh, the, the, the best way how to move around to actually put things together, let's say. This is what you see here, is our motion studies by Frank and William Gilbert, and they are, were actually trying to optimize the way how you actually do things. But this, of course, on one side was a very... Um, it created a lot of drudgery. What that means is, let's say, you know, people went to work, and when they were working, they were doing just one thing more than day, right? So, and that was also something that was reflected in popular culture. I guess you also saw this movie where Charlie Chaplin was part of the 
of the machine and how they were trying to say, well, okay, maybe not everything is fine or good that uh, industry is producing. Uh, on the other hand, what started to happen was, you know, when before you had one person producing one, let's say, assembly of, of a car, he had to have a lot of knowledge about how to use different tools or how to use different processes to actually assemble those things. But now all that, that knowledge was taken away and was put into this kind of long uh, stream of things. No? So these are kind of negative things about, uh, let's say, the culture of that, that started to develop around, around the mass production. But on the, the other hand, you have very positive things. Um, what started to develop then was a consumeristic culture because a lot of these people, what they were, uh, the, the products that they were producing, they were also be able, were able to use them. And on top of that, what started to happen was also that a lot of free time was being available. So you had to fill it up in different ways. So you had, um, let's say before, people were not able to afford TV sets or refrigerators. And this was something very new for the working class. Another thing is that first time in, in history is that uh, everyday family could afford a car. And this changed also the way how people were able to use that free time that they were now getting. That meant that they went, let's say, to nature, uh, explored things around, and that's something that was before really reserved for very privileged classes, where right? they would go to, I don't know, to Europe to travel around to see the things. But now, that was also possible for everyday workers. And that was a really big shift in terms of you know, accessibility to different types of uh, products that before were not part of your life. Another one would be uh, these kind of things. When department stores started to, uh, to happen, what that means is that, let's say on Saturday or Sunday, people wouldn't just go to a church or wouldn't just go to, uh, to a park. They would also go into the department store to, to have different kind of life, a leisure life, and so on. And again, this was, let's say, this kind of a life or this kind of things that you were able to do with your free time were reserved before for people with a lot of money. And now that the production became so cheap and you had profusion of different products that you could do, um, it was at one point accessible to, to, to masses. And this really changed, let's say, the attitude towards technology, the attitude towards um, what does it mean that you can afford you know, a phone or, or a television and so on. And that was also felt within these areas, uh, because for, for the working class, the, the, the industry, these this huge you know, areas, they were really kind of their civic pride. They were really proud that they were able to work there, that they were able also to you know, afford what they were making. And it, that is also very present in the morphology of all these older uh, cities. Also. You can see here, this is a Packard Motor Car Company, so it's one of the big cities. And it's really you know, the, the connection between what you do in your work and where you, you, you work with. What to do when you are in spare time is very close, so you have all the houses just next to the, to the industry. And this kind of a close connection between uh, life and work is something that in the industrial process has moved away now that we have all the industries that have the outskirts and so on. If we just don't stay in, in the USA, this is also a similar example from, um, from Berlin. This is Bernd's Halle in. Mobit, where they were doing a turbine, uh, where it was a uh, turbine factory. And you can also see this kind of close connection between the, the industrial estate and, and the housing. And I think this is really important. It's important because it not that just supports a different kind of life that you can do, it also supports different kind of um, ecology of this space. Um, to regress a bit, to to talk a bit more maybe about the free time around. So in all of these kind of workers' centers, uh, another big thing started to develop, which is group sports. And I don't know if you know, but you know, Manchester United Club started as a, as a club of a railway company. And it was just a bunch of guys who you know, came together and so on. And this is something really important also when we think about culture 
and then we think about what kind of culture we're producing. The industry produces this kind of culture. Now, that's not just true for, uh, for UK or anywhere else, it's also true for places around here. The top one is from Slovenia, it's a football club from Maribor, and the bottom one is, I think, it's somewhere very close to here. On the other hand, let's say what technology also brought was not just a kind of mundane everyday culture, it also brought you know, high art and understanding of, let's say, praising of technology in high art. So in Europe, art movements like uh, vorticism and futurism began to uh, emerge that praise technology, technological process, and they tried to, to kind of show how important it was. Right? Well, let's say this one is also very important, very interesting. Uh, this is a mural on a wall of the uh, Detroit Institute of Art in Detroit. And at the bottom you can see is this uh, praising of the uh, assembly line and the, the, the foundries. This is a place uh, called the Weber Rouge plant, which was one of the biggest plants for making uh, cars. Actually, on one side came in all the raw materials, so they brought in the, the coats and the, the iron and the rubber. And on the other hand, you, you, you had your cars. It's actually like that. But, and on the top, I would like to, uh -huh, I would like to share this too. So here are kind of two, one is kind of saying, okay, beware of technology. And the other one is saying, well, technology is giving this. You could almost say, you know, it's taking us much, much closer to the God. Um, let's look at the, this one on the right side. It's a, it's a clear, um, let's say, connection to the nativity of Jesus, where you have, you know, Joseph vaccinating a child and Mary being the, the nurse, and on the back you have the three wise men being the, the scientists. And it just shows how, how much how proud everyone was about what technology is making for a humankind, what kind of things we are able to achieve because of it. And I think this is, uh, we have to understand this, this time through this kind of spectrum that it's been a really big kind of uh, start. You know, we can do it, yeah, you know, to, uh, to technology we're going to save the world and so on. But of course not everything was always meant to stay or meant to uh, to be so positive, so the other one, even though we're not talking about age point in Detroit, we talk about some other types of misfortunes and problems. So the big problems started to happen around the 50s, uh, and those are the problems that we are still facing in the West. In the West, I mean like the, usually you would call it global, uh, global North, so the, or the Europe, USA, and so on. And um, the problem is that we are losing, or we are losing a lot of this culture that's connected to industry because we are losing industry. And I would like just to tell why, or let's say two reasons why. First is automation. Automation means that what you're actually doing is a lot of the knowledge that is in the production and done by people, you put it onto onto uh, onto the machines. And with this, a lot of knowledge that was embedded in whatever they were doing was lost. The other thing is definitely, for me, one of the most important part is containerization. So the, the point of how to transport large, large amount of stuff all over the world revolutionized completely the, the whole global network. Uh, and why was that possible? It was because of this guy. This guy is called Marco Mutin, and he came up with how to make this uh, very modular container. He then patented it, but then the point was that he released the patent so everyone could copy and use the same way of creating these containers. Which means that whenever into whichever port you would get, you would get always the same containers, always the same system of using to actually move them on and off the barge and so on. And this made the transport so cheap that it really doesn't matter whether it's produced here or in China. Talking about China, yes, of course, where the majority of the production went was in China. And this is what I would like to, to say, you know. 
when you look what this kind of production did for, let's say, yeah, in this example for the tribe, right, where you have all these people that were able to use those pairs, you create all kind of one culture that is that is circling this production. And this kind of um, environment is really rich and interesting. On the other hand, now it moves to, uh, to China and also changed in terms of how the production is actually thought of. Or how the, let's say, just people who are actually doing these uh, things, who are assembling things, can actually relate to the product that they are doing. And I think this is a really big switch also in terms of what, what production is nowadays. So what happened in the West? Well, we got this big split, split between the city of ideas, which is something we are mainly doing in the West, city of, of services, and the city of produ production. Right? Everything that needs to be produced, which needs, uh, which has a lot of, uh, which needs a lot of manpower or it has a lot of, uh, it's very labor intensive, has been just put away. But with that, we didn't just put away the, uh, the production as such. We put away all this, you know, all this uh, um, culture that we had embedded in this process. So what happened was things like this, where right? you get huge industrial carcasses lying all over Europe. And a lot of cities in the last also like 20, 30 years, when a lot of this production went from, from Europe, okay, not from Germany, but let's say from Slovenia definitely, we lost, or let's say from North Italy, which has a lot of textile production, all went to Bangladesh. So, you know, what to do with this kind of holes? cities which are completely emptied out of, of, of production, of, of it's a culture that's connected to production. Well some, you know, kind of the most important or the most interesting thing was uh, regeneration uh, regenerating these kind of cities through uh, service sector. What does that mean? Well the service sector is a soft part of the economy which is a activities uh, where people offer the knowledge and time to, to, to improve productivity, performance and potential. So let's say you know, what I'm doing right now is service sector, or let's say um, teaching is service sector, um, health and uh, tourism is service sector and so on. So a lot of these places started to put in a lot of ideas about okay, how should we reinvent our city in terms of um, in terms of tourism or in terms of, of knowledge economy and so on. I will just uh, give you one example to which I can then come back to how to integrate the, the making. Um, I guess we architects all know uh, Bilbao. No? But when we talk about Bilbao, we think only about the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao who was made by Frank Gehry. Right? And that's something that happens when you inject um, something like a tertiary sector, uh, like, uh, like tourism, into the city to redevelop it. So when you Google Bilbao, uh, the majority of images that you get is of the Guggenheim Museum. So, and when you go there, the main thing you want to do, you have to go there and you want to see this building and you want to see what's happening there and so on. And that's about it, right? Okay, maybe you go to another uh, place here and there, and then you go already, okay, wait, what else can I do here? And then you start going. It's really strange type of culture that we are actually creating. So, what kind of culture is it? You know, this kind of, um, let's say, high art that is put in display in Bilbao is something completely different then let's say culture that is uh, accreting around a bunch of people working in an industry, making things, uh, having their life connected to everything that's happening there and so on. So this kind of culture that we are creating, let's say, is catering mainly for things like tourism, right? This is not high culture made for the purpose of understanding what is happening in the technology, like the, the, the frescoes I was showing before. This is, really targeting, let's say, tourists. And then you go there and you see this big, big spider and go like, wow, how cool it is. And this is not something that's happening just in a few you know, cities. Like the, the main strategies involving development of cities go in the direction of mixing culture and then knowledge economy. And 
then sometimes a bit of technology that has um, So what we create is a kind of like constructed culture that creates a very flat city, a very flat understanding of the city. Like this guy, let's say, this guy making uh, goldsmiths in the city is not anymore doing it as part of something he used to do, it's just showing you know, some processes that were used uh, 100 years ago. So what we actually create is the so the predominant type, predominant type of life in this kind of city is generated by free time activities like shopping, drinking coffee, looking at uh, tourist attractions and so on. And when you look at, let's say, city centers all around Europe, the city centers of, of, of uh, cities that are losing industrial production, you can see that if they were able to kind of get out from the economical problems, they would mainly do it through this. And Ljubljana is one example where I, like, in the last 10 years it's changed so much that I can't actually I don't recognize it. So why I'm ranting all the time about this making and renewal of making, I'll just give you one small example. Let's say this is a traditional jewelry shop. Uh, in a traditional jewelry shop you would have you would have local people coming in trying to you know, order some bespoke jewelry. And the master would would, um, would accept them and talk to them, give them tea, blah, 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 talk about what they want. At the back, you would have a workshop where the apprentice would be, trans where the knowledge would be transferred from the master to the apprentice, how to make those things. At the top, you would have a master's house with his family and so on. And on top of that, you would have apprentice dorms where you would have apprentices who are also part of the family and so on. So you get this really rich, life and ecology that is all centered around what you are doing. But there wouldn't be just this guy who would be doing the who would be doing the jewelry, there would be a copper smith, there would be a blacksmith, there would be a baking guy and so on. So you have this very rich um, understanding of what a city is. Right? You have so many different things and right now if you go and say to Ljubljana you go what for coffee? You know you go for something to eat and you go and buy something in H&M, that's it. And you go for a tourist attraction. Right, and nowadays what happens is exactly that, right? This guy in front is actually selling still the, the wares. At the back he's importing something from China and is, you know, exhibiting here. On the top there would be a hostel with, with rooms to rent for tourists. And funny enough, of course, you'd say this is a guy who is doing exactly the same thing, right? This is not anymore a craft of someone who knows how to sew, that is part of the, 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 the deeper structure of the city in terms of what it actually produces, or what kind of light it enables. No, it's mainly there for a Disneyland kind of environment to actually sell it to tourists, that when they go home, they can say, oh, look what I got in the guy. So, when we look at these two kind of understanding of cities, and when we look, I, I like to show it like this, there are these two images. Right? The bottom one is from 1910s in the same street as the top one. And I would say that uh, the culture that was created by them, that was searching around all these different things that were able to provide to, uh, to someone living there, is much more rich and much more, uh, has much more depth than the one we have right now. And I think this is a really, really big problem. And the main problem is exactly because of this uh, separation between, uh, uh, between knowledge and production. Right? We are mainly doing the service sector, so producing knowledge to think about how to do things, and then we, we put them somewhere else to do it. And I think it's really important to integrate making into cities to make them more diverse and resilient to change. Because, you know, imagine if you have, if you have just one type of economy that you are using within the city. And if that economy gets into trouble, I think the whole city is going to go. Just look what happened to Detroit. Detroit was singly and completely focused only on car production. So when car production went to China, not China, to back then to Japan first and to other places, they were completely devastated. And like you know, they lost 
I think it was like 500,000 year uh, employment in, in, in a few years. Well, that's a huge you know, shift. And the only way how we can actually provide for this kind of, uh, let's say, in cities to provide for, uh, for stability is to diversify it. And being completely uh, only in one economic sector like tourism or let's say knowledge production, it's also problematic. Now, there are already some examples how these things are turning for the better, let's say, in, for the for the Western economies. The insourcing boom is a kind of a concept that has been quite interesting for the last few years and it's talking about bringing production back to the, uh, to the countries where it was present before. Let's say this is a good example by General Electric Appliances. They are the biggest production producers of, of, uh, of household appliances in the US, like uh, I don't know here what. We have Bohemian experience, and, and they are bringing a lot of their production back because they saw that if uh, a very famous story is when they brought back uh, a water heater, a very simple thing, right, a boiler, from China, and they opened it up, they saw how it was made. They brought some people uh, to say, okay, you guys know how to weld things together and to do this pipe, and can you? think with us engineers together how we can actually do this better. And when they re-engineered the, the boiler in the US together with the knowledge from people who know how to make them, they came out that they were able to do it much faster and cheaper and more, and the boiler was more energy efficient. Just because you had this connection between the, 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 the engineers, so the ones who are actually thinking about how to do this, and the people who actually know how to make it. And I think it's really important to, to cherish this connection. So connection between an engineering, so research and development part, and the production part, which is process and assembly. And in the last 30 years, we've completely lost that. And these kind of bigger firms, they actually now they start to finally get into the idea, OK, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. OK, that kind of solves one part of it. Um, Solves the part of it where you can think, okay, big industries can come back. Not everything will be able to come back, but definitely some of it could be. But that still has a problem of what. But what do you do with kind of all city centers? Right? You can't chug, uh, you know, a Gorenia plant in the middle of Ljubljana and expect everyone to be happy about it. Well, there's some very funny things happening, let's say, in city centers. Um, First, I was quite uh, against this kind of uh, hipster culture, where you see these funny guys running around with fixie bikes with, uh, with moustache and so on. But I think, you know, they are latching onto something. It's about this kind of uh, level of making or doing things. Right? Maybe it's not still on the right level of saying, okay, this will not be able to provide for a whole economy of the city, but it's in the right direction. So with this kind of culture, what kind of lifestyle comes around? It's a lifestyle that I guess everyone who's been a bit around kind of likes and want to be part of. You know, it's this kind of uh, nice marketplaces, good coffee shops, you know, nice apartments going to uh, that's what let's say happens in Shoreditch and so on. But in order to have that kind of life, you don't need you don't need only fixy bikes and guys with moustache. You need something much more uh, substantial to that. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, this is Sh Shinola. Shinola is a, is a bespoke, let's say, company that produces nice, like, not luxury, but slightly better uh, products. They do bikes, um, um, upholstery, and, and watches. And everything is produced in Detroit, and everything is produced locally from local materials and local know-how. They're actually saying, when you go to their site, you can see this kind of uh, advertising, you know, our watch factory in Detroit, right? So they're actually bringing knowledge from, uh, they actually got knowledge from Switzerland to educate local people 
how to make watches so they are connected to like local community, working with them, what to, how to do things and so on. On the other hand, they are connecting also to the knowledge economy through the local uh, to the local school of design. So new product placement and new ideas how to develop their brand is coming from there. And then these guys then can connect back to the people who are actually making the watches. So you have this connection from you know, making that is actually part of one floor within the building where the, uh, where the school sits, which is part of the city, which is actually part of this whole ecology that is happening around this place, which actually supports this guy who can then give you the latte macchiato in the end or a nice coffee. And you have to understand all this kind of work levels of involvement when you start thinking about oh yeah I want to have a nice place where I can work and so on. Now all nice and fine but the problem is it doesn't end just there. It goes actually another level deeper. So when I was looking at this and how does you know, a company like uh, like Shanola actually start you, you come up with someone some guys called bedrock and you say, okay so who are bedrock? You know, you go online and you go onto their site and there's virtually nothing else but their like, front page, there's nothing else really. And then when I was looking a bit more around and came to like, the business site of Bloomberg where you have all the companies in there, and it says Bedrock is a venture capital investing in certain things. And you go, aha, that's why. So in order to have that guy making Latin Macchiato, in order to have all the knowledge economy that's happening around that, to have those guys that are locally producing knowledge and so on, you need some guy called Mr. Tom Katsotis who gives the money for it. That's, that's a tough choice. And then when you look further, and okay, so who is Tom Katsotis? You come to Fossil. I guess you know Fossil. Fossil is a big producer of all kinds of bags and watches. They mainly produce things in, of course, in China and Bangladesh. But what you actually get through these kind of uh, companies is, um, let's say, what Shinola gets from them, it's not just, you know, it gets their know-how, it gets their um, connections, their infrastructure, in order to be able to create things locally. And I think we, in, in today's world, it's really hard to think about, um, about small local things that are not part of this bigger um, integrated world. And also in this sense, let's say, we have to think about these kind of places. Let's say in, in Europe, everywhere you have a lot of these co-working spaces where young teams or young professionals are starting with their big ideas. But in order for these things to actually succeed, you have to know that there is this certification again of all of this stuff that comes with it in order to be successful. Uh, and to think about uh, you know, that fraction of making that, that is actually produced, you have to know that there is a lot of other things that come with it. So for, uh, to finish things off, um, I would finish with one example. Um, this is a place in Ljubljana, it's, it, was a, it was a bicycle factory, it's called the Rome, and it was operating from 51 to 95 and then they closed down because it was just not feasible to do it anymore. So about 10 years ago it was spotted and in there you have a lot of alternative groups um, mainly connected to on one side art or to some kind of uh, workshopping and so on. And it's actually quite an interesting way of how it developed. And now the city, of course, they are now, the city wants to redevelop it and they want to do again something uh, big and interesting. And for them, what they came up with was creative industries. So all that part that I was telling that you need a really long supply chain in order to get working. Right? So let's say, you know, um, the, it's called the old street around, around uh, London is place for the creative industry. But they have all that support that I was just talking, showing you before. So it's really questionable to think about how you can actually bring things like a high value customers in here. So I think 
a good way around it would be to start from the other side, not from the start side of thinking about how to make ideas, but from the side of thinking about how to make things. And I think it's really important to, let's say, I would say create a center for craft research and development. So to think about how the making can be reintroduced into the city. So connect uh, high tech with, with craft. To research, you know, those kind of people that actually know how to make things that can help you create a better uh, boiler heater. They can also um, think about other processes with you to develop things together. So connecting traditional craft making to research in universities would be also quite interesting. And implementing management and economic infrastructure to put innovation to market. That means that you need to have uh, all that in place in order to do these kind of things. So I think if we start to think about all the knowledge that we have lost and that we can actually bring back to this making, I think we can also make cities much more livable, or let's say much more um, viable for different type of people that we do. And for the end, only by combining knowledge of making with knowledge of ideas can we establish richer cultural, cultural life that supports resilient, resiliency and sustainable development of cities.